Welcome to the Irish Tech News Podcast, where we will bring you some of the most interesting interviews and features from the world of tech. Visit irishtechnews.ie and check out our podcast section to explore all of our previous episodes. You can subscribe to our podcast using whatever your favourite app or service is by visiting anchor.fm forward slash irish dash tech dash news. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Irish Tech News, to the Crypto Corner. This is your host, Jamil Hassan, where I interview founders, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, uh, executives, leaders, thought leaders, you name it, in crypto and blockchain globally. And uh, today I have an amazing guest. Um, She is the founder and executive director of Code to Inspire. Uh, she's on the advisory board of Unity Global Education. Her name is Fareshta Faro. Um, welcome to the show today. Thank you so much, Jamil, for having me. Very welcome. Very welcome. Uh, so let's kick things off. Um, I actually use I usually ask the same question. I'm going to change it up a bit. First question for you is, what is your story? Uh, I realize it's an inspirational one. Uh, could you please share it with us? Sure. Well, I was born as an Afghan refugee in Iran during the Soviet invasion to Afghanistan. My parents fled the war early 80s. So like a lot of refugees, they start a life from nothing. And um, I was born in a small town between Iran and Afghanistan border. Um, Certainly being born as a refugee, you face a lot of challenges and discrimination just because of the indifferences that you are. Um, or you have. Um, So for me, accessing education was very challenging. Every year we had to get certain papers from the government to um, get to the school. And also because of the refugee, we didn't have access to a lot of um, basic fundamentals uh, uh, rights. Uh, For example, um, accessing to bank accounts, being able to open a bank account, being able to access to certain jobs. So we had very limited opportunities. Um, but that being being said, um, my mom learned how to stitch and make dresses and by selling them, she could bring income to the family and um, invest on the girls' education where I was able to finish my high school in Iran. Um, 2002, one year after the fall of Taliban, uh, we went back to Afghanistan to Herat. Uh, it's a city in the west part of Afghanistan where my parents are from. And I was able to get my bachelor in computer science. Um, And then I received a scholarship. I went to Germany and I got my master's in Technical University of Berlin in computer science. Went back to Afghanistan and taught as a computer science professor for about three years in Herat University. Um, And then 2012, I came to the US and um, since then I've been here. And um, late 2014, I founded Code to Inspire as the first computer coding school for girls in Afghanistan. Awesome. So I want to ask you more about that. What uh, what is Code to Inspire all about? Yeah, so um, definitely establishing Code to Inspire for me was very um, personal um, because of my uh, journey as a refugee and also as a woman in technology and facing a lot of backlashes, pushbacks, um, limited access to equal resources, variable sexual harassment. I decided to create a space that would be very safe for women and also family trust um, our place and send their daughters. Um, it would be free of charge because a lot of families um, tend to invest on the um, education for boys as extracurricular activities because they think that the boy going to you know, bring money to the family and the girl is going to get married. And then third, um, create this space and teach certain technical skills that can be translated into work opportunities for them in the community or we can outsource projects. So with that being said, um, um, our mission is really to empower young women in Afghanistan age 18 to 25 years old to drive economic and social progress. So we teach them um, coding and graphic design um, by um, hiring local mentors um, and help them to you know, build digital careers, 
uh, launch technology ventures or uh, um, have the opportunity to become financially independent. Um, and that's what we do with Code to Inspire. As of now, we have one location that's in, in Herat. I, uh, I have to ask this question from my understanding as a follow up. Um, because back in 2012, I mean, I wasn't the greatest Obama, uh, Barack Obama fan uh, at the time. Um, I later understood what he what what was going on, but um, there were a lot of Afghanistan refugees who came into the country in 2012 and 13, and I never really understood the benefits of that playing out over time. And now it's been, you know, eight nine years later. So I wanted to see what your what you um, experience was of the benefits of of that um them coming here and, and learning and growing and, and building lives well um for sure you know being a refugee and forced to leave your hometown um against your will it's not something that anyone wants to do but um the fact that i was um fortunate enough that i was able to come to the us um was very helpful for me because I was able to give back to my country in a bigger way, um, even though because of the immigration and the pending immigration I was dealing with, I wasn't able to go back to Afghanistan these past uh, nine years. Um, and of course, with the situation right now, I don't know if I would be able to go back. Um, what I did, I uh, used the technology as a tool to empower myself and you know, give back to my community. Um, I was able to establish Code to Inspire in my apartment in Brooklyn, raise funds, um, you know, build my organization, find advisory board, um, create and build the curriculum, find the team and the students in Afghanistan. So um, really like the, the resources that I was giving here um was enabling me to to be able you know to give back to my community and um and and build that school from scratch um and be able to you know travel freely um in the country see people who are like-minded who are um, interested to support um, was something that was difficult certainly for me joining in afghanistan with the issue of mobility for women and security and safety um, and that was like one of the reasons that I was able to, to, you know, meet people and get help for my organization. I think that's great. Great. Awesome. And speaking of great, you say a slogan of, of uh, Code to Inspire is great things can start with empty hands. So um, what great things have you seen get accomplished since you funded this organization? Yes, yeah, so um, so that's the slogan that it's always stays with me, and that's because, as I said, with my mom learning how to stitch and make dresses, um, and bringing income. So from a young age, I learned how to be entrepreneur. And necessarily, you don't need to have everything ready for you to do something. You can just use, you know, what's around you in your favor and benefit. Um, and with Code to Inspire, um, since two thousand fifteen. And we've educated more than 350 students in our coding and graphic design classes. And um, with the data we have from our graduates, 60% of them found job within the community and were getting paid. Um, and many of them were the sole um, breadwinner of the family. We have outsourced more than 30 projects coding or graphic design worth of $40,000. And these are the girls that are getting paid um, $50 to $1,500 per project. And some of them are making double or triple than the men in the family, which the average income monthly family in Afghanistan is about 150. Um, we've um, created more than 50 social impact games, applications, animations that are geared towards certain issue in the community and addressing that problem and raise awareness. Um, so even right now with what's going on in Afghanistan, we do have about 20 graduates and students that are working remotely on paid projects for clients around the world. So the fact that we were able to have a lot of, of these students who've never touched a computer, who've never been online, um, even didn't have a basic phone, 
uh, to learn about um, um, technical skills and either coding or graphic design and be able to work remotely um, and change their lives in that way. I think we are very proud of that. You know, I, I, I can't get over the pictures from 1975, you know, of, of the women in Afghanistan wearing shorts and bikini tops and, and things have changed, you know, dramatically um, since then. So what, what is the current reality of women in Afghanistan and why has it, how has it changed so dramatically and how could this course um, be corrected or reversed? in the most beneficial humanitarian way? Well, um, well, sadly, since the Taliban take over early August, um, a lot of things has changed on the ground for the women of Afghanistan who fought really so hard this past two decades to just uh, gain the very basic fundamental human rights. Um, a lot of the Taliban policies really violate women's rights in Afghanistan. Um, since they took power, they announced the cabinet, um, and the, um, they have they haven't appointed anyone, um, any woman in the cabinet. Um, the same as deputy ministers that they appointed, uh, no women is included. Um, they um, um, abolished the Ministry of Women's Affairs, um, and in some provinces and some cities, they you know women being told not to come to work, um, even education. Um, a lot of the private and public universities and schools are being closed for women. Um, and a lot of women protection centers that were safe house for women are being harassed or closed. Um, certainly violence against women is increasing and you see um, a lot of women protesting every day and being threatened or taken or unfortunately being killed. Um, um, by the Taliban or target killings, you know, women activists, journalists. So um, certainly uh, women of Afghanistan are living um, in a nightmare and all their rights are being taken. And uh, just a fact to see that it is still the women of Afghanistan who are every day on the streets protesting for their very basic fundamental human rights and um, no one is really um, supporting them, not, um, you know, the human rights organizations and um, international community is very concerning. Um, and to my point, I think um, what is really needed is that without any doubt, the very basic fundamental human rights of women being able to get education, being able to get to work um, and have the freedom to choose what they want to pursue in their life should be given without any questions to the women of Afghanistan and the role of um, organizations and um, entities like us that we try to give this um, um, equal resources to women to get educated to be able to work in a safe environment is very important because it helps the women not only um, boost their self-esteem but also access um, uh, equal resources in a way that they can be financially free and um, for a woman to be independent and financially be in charge of her own life is very important because then she will have a voice in the family by bringing income to the family and later on the community. That makes sense to me. Um, and you're doing something about it. Code to Inspire is actually doing something you're partnering um, with Binance, you know, and this is where the crypto comes in, right? Uh, you're partnering with Binance on a project for helping women, you know, impacted by that Taliban takeover, right? Um, how will this collaboration work uh, for the and, and assist those women um, who, you know, were impacted by the Taliban takeover? Well, um, the partnership that we had recently with Binance, um, it's certainly because we both share common values. You know, we we care about improving gender equality, quality education, and the impact that we are doing on the ground being transparent. Um, and of course, we both stand against inequality, especially in workforce. And um, we want to create a sustainable ecosystem you know, through innovative ideas that the girls and women can access those resources. 
Um, so that's why we're going to use blockchain or cryptocurrency as a tool to empower these individuals uh, to gain financial freedom. Um, I can say that with this partnership, uh, we had about 100 students of us that were struggling to, uh, um, to you know, um, bring food to the family and pay for emergency medical expenses because a lot of them lost jobs. And um, with this partnership, we were we helped them to create actually um, a wallet, uh, BUSD wallet, and receive firsthand um, cash assistance. And I think the fact that they were able to create a um, wallet and experience their first financial uh, literacy, financial freedom in such a way was very eye-opening to a lot of them and very powerful. Even we had students that they said like they were in disbelief that they could receive money in such a way that they weren't afraid that their money will be confiscated. It was very transparent. It was very safe. It was very private. Um, and it was very eye opening for them. And I think that partnership helped a lot of our girls not only um, to get on their feet, uh, you know, and, um, and and not face food insecurity and and be able to um, kind of att pay attention more to their education rather than being worried about, you know, the daily um, issues regarding, you know, what they're facing. And then just the fact that, again, it helped them to understand the technology. It's so powerful that can help a girl in Afghanistan, even being under the Taliban regime to access equal resources was, uh, was uh, life changing for them. So you have these girls who are these women and women who are uh, working in who are in Afghanistan who have now learned about wallets and how to set up crypto uh, how to set up blockchains and crypto and different blockchain for social impact projects um, on the ground. Uh, what are some of the successes that you've seen some of these women um, accomplish? Well, as of now, um, as I said previously, we have about 20, 25 graduates and students who are working with um, companies remotely and are getting paid um, and in, a, in a country that uh, half of the, but sorry, I rephrase that again. Um, well, the reality on the ground for a lot of our graduates and students is that, um, as I said, 20, 25 uh, graduates of our school are working with clients um, around the world that are getting paid, and a lot of them are getting paid through cryptocurrency. Um, in a country that, as of now, half of the population are facing um, starvation, food insecurity, the economy is collapsing, the banks are not functioning. Um, and, um, and and for someone to will be able to convert their technical skills into financial um, um, stability and gain that freedom is, is just like very life changing. Um, we have a couple of our students who actually passed interviews, technical interviews for some companies in the US and are getting and are going to get hired full time. We actually have some graduates that may be able to get um, work visa and leave Afghanistan and work for companies. So we're constantly working to find uh, companies who can hire our students either virtually or the ability to give them visa to travel. And um, if we can change uh, one life, a one girl life in a family and help her to be financially independent, we are changing the lives of a lot of people in that family. Um, and that's like um, a slow process. But we believe that the change has already happened since we started our work about six, five years ago. You're setting an example for others. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. So I want to scroll to a larger picture. Um, these wars, you know, with, in Afghanistan with, with Russia, with the U.S., with other countries. You know, what else could blockchain technology provide us with like the real answers to and the real insights into, you know, for these epic government failures? Well, for me, I'm sorry. Well, um, for me, I think the um, just the fact that blockchain technology um, and especially 
in the payment way, like using crypto, like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies uh, will open more doors for our students um, to get access to the global economy. Um, it's just like, um, it's it just like very, very uh, um, life changing in a way that um, as of now that the banks are collapsed, uh, the PayPal is not working in Afghanistan, Western Union has limited access to um, um, withdraw or send money to just uh, being able to uh, get over traditional banking infrastructure and be able to uh, remove those, you know, middle band and gatekeepers that um, sometimes they treat you unfairly just because of the instability or political uh, situations in the country. Um, that in and itself, it's very empowering for any individual. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman to just be able to connect to the global economy uh, without any middleman and discrimination and be able to um, access to your finances wherever uh, you are and whenever you want. Um, it's, 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 it's very important. And besides that, I think the technology itself and using blockchain as a way to you know, keep identities private, um, uh, encrypted, um, transparent, and uh, in different ways, I think there's a big future for it, especially in regions and areas like Afghanistan that have been facing with conflicts and war and instability for, for ages. And right now with the Taliban takeover, it's very important for everyone to keep their identity, their information, their finances as private, as encrypted as they can, so that they can protect themselves. So in your, in your view, does blockchain technology knock down and eliminate both gender and country barriers so that we can achieve economic reform and prosperity? And if so, how? Yes, absolutely. It will bridge the digital, gender, economic, um, political divide. It, it's very powerful tool for people to understand that you can be very independent from these old nation states and um, any um, political instability that come and it may affect you and you just want to be protected. That sounds good. And um, yeah, my uh, my father passed away in 2017 in August when I first got into crypto. Um, and he he grew up in um, in Pakistan and um, came here into the to the to the U.S. in 1961 um, and went to grad school at Virginia Tech where I got my degree. Um, and I have never been to Pakistan um i've been told you know you know i'm probably not going to get there now uh, this at this stage sometime soon that i couldn't go because it's not safe for americans right um how do we how do we be able to 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 collaborate to work together to build that global society and what words of encouragement or wisdom would you share with people who um who might be a little bit scared to to you know travel or somewhere or could discover somewhere new or you know, open their eyes to, to what else might be out there in the world? Well, um, I think it's a, uh, it's like, you know, when we rely on certain media or news that like they project one sided ideas, that's like what we get caught. And I think it's very important for everyone um, to, you know, find people who are on the ground locally, you know, and um, experiencing everything firsthand. And I think the issue that unfortunately made this catastrophe happen in Afghanistan with huge amount of international community support and presence um, with the US, NATO and other European countries is that they weren't able to really understand the culture and the people on the ground and be able to um, collaborate and work with locals. You know, they brought these big um, companies that they were um, outside of Afghanistan and then they started to kind of like bring expertise in people who are, um, who had no idea about the culture and the people on the ground. And that's why um, it failed some of this um, support and help because they didn't know what to do and 
what the people on the ground really needs. And I think even right now, if anyone wants to get educated really about what's going on on the ground, I highly recommend that they get educated um, and find um, organizations that are doing work right now on the ground and saving lives or improving the quality of lives of people either through education you know human rights either through health either through uh, you know um just providing shelters food and everything i mean um I'll talk to them um and understand what they're doing and help them and i think as much as we can find this grassroots organizations that are directly with, with locals and empower them it's much more bigger uh, voice and you can bring much more bigger impact rather than finding um, big companies or organizations that are going there and trying to to help and do something and it's actually not clear where is the input and output just because it's a big organization and you make it lost and you don't know actually also where your money goes um, so I think I encourage people to you know um, learn more about that and um, talk to the people on the ground and get to know them um, and no help is a small like you, you don't think that uh, if you're help you think oh it might be so small every help that you do for people on the ground will change a life and it will go a long way um, and um, and I and I encourage people to you know diversify their um source of news and you know updates uh, that they get to see different perspectives awesome um thank you i want to thank you very much for your time today this has been an honor and a pleasure i enjoyed talking to you i'm going to find out more about your organization um it's really interesting so um it's been an honor and i have one last question um is this uh, how can people find out more information about you about code to inspire about your organization about what you're up to how, how can they do that? Uh, yes, um, so they can check our website, code to an uh, For updates, they can follow me on Twitter or our coding school. We post uh, about our activities, um, the next steps and plans. We are very excited even now with what's happening on the ground that we announced a new coding class and we have about 120 applicants that just registered. Um, and also um, our next steps um, if you are um, um, if you want to you know donate to our cause we accept uh, cryptocurrency and also different kind of donations if you want to join our board and help us with your expertise we are happy to talk to you and see how we can work if you want to give a job opportunity for our students we are also very excited and keen to learn about it so any opportunity that you think might be helpful for us to uh, navigate and explore, we are very open and happy to talk about it. Um, and at the end, I would like to say this um, saying from Rumi, who is a 13th century Farsi poet, um, who always inspires me, who said, where there is ruin, there is hope for a treasure. Um, Afghanistan going through decades of war and destruction and I think that's something that comes to people's minds always when you say Afghanistan um, but I can say for me the treasures um, among the ruins are the girls in Afghanistan and by investing in their education we will um, create a generation that would be uh, peace builders and um, you know will change the future for Afghanistan so investing in girls' education is something that is very vital at the moment. And anyone in any capacity that can do that um, would go a long way and um, will change the future of Afghanistan. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much, Jamil. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the latest Irish Tech News podcast. Check back every day for the latest episode. You can follow us on Twitter at Irish underscore tech news. On Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Irish Tech News. On LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash Irish dash tech dash news. On Instagram, instagram.com forward slash Irish Tech News dot IE. And on TikTok, tiktok.com forward slash at Irish Tech News.